All right, so we are recording. I see people coming into the room. Hello, some familiar faces or some familiar familiar names, I should say. <laughs> we can't see anyone, but hello. Thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, my name is Sophie Hinge. I'm the Education and Public Programs Coordinator at the Art Gallery of Windsor. Um, we're so glad that you're able to join us this evening for In Conversation, Ian Baxter and, and Susan Gold with Spencer Mulcahy. Um, so we're just waiting on Ian. He's, he'll be here in, in a few short minutes. Uh, we're just experiencing some technical difficulties, but uh, he should be joining us very soon, which will give us enough time to do our quick and uh, brief introductions. Mm -hmm. um, so we have our agenda here, so you know what to expect for this evening. We'll start off with our land acknowledgement, followed by our pillar of creating conversations. Why are we here this evening? Um, then I will follow that up with our introduction of our moderator and our speakers, followed by a discussion period and a Q&A. So if you have any questions for the artist or the curator of the exhibition, Restored Treasures, um, you can pop them in the Q&A as well. Um, they're easier to follow than in the chat, so um, we'll be sure to keep an eye on the Q&A box. So any questions can go in there. So we'll all take a moment just to acknowledge the land on which we gather this evening. The Art Gallery of Windsor respectively acknowledges that we are located on Anishinaabe territory, the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. And today, the Anishinaabe of the Three Fires Confederacy are represented by Walpole Island First Nation. And we want to state our respect of the historical and ongoing authority of Walpole Island First Nation over its territory. And we encourage you to do the same wherever you may be. We encourage you to find out whose land are you on and take a moment of gratitude and thanks. So we're here this evening to create conversations. We're here to spark community conversations around ideas and issues such as history, culture, society, and using the gallery's collection and exhibitions to spark those conversations. Um, so we encourage in, in, um, respectful engagement and curious questions about the topic of this conversation. So again, Feel free to use the chat in the Q&A box as well. Um, we love questions. So, so with that said, I'll introduce our moderator and our curator um, of Restored Treasures Part 1. And we'll get to learn more about the exhibit and kind of uh, see behind the scenes. So Spencer Moncan uh, received his Bachelor of Science Honors with a specialization in chemistry and visual art from the University of Windsor. Intrigued by the chemical materiality of fine art, he obtained a master's of art conservation from Queen's University, specializing in painting con uh, conservation. Spencer completed internships at Fraser Spafford Ricci Art and Archival Conservation and the National Gallery of Canada Conservation Laboratories. After his studies, Spencer worked in the Conservation and Restoration Laboratory at the National Gallery of Canada. He then moved back to his hometown of Windsor, Ontario to start a private conservation practice. So thank you for being here, Spencer. We're glad to have you. Um, I'll introduce as well our, our panelist. We hope that he can join us this evening, but Ian Baxter and um, will be joining us very soon, we hope. Uh, one of Canada's foremost living artists, Baxter And, is recognized internationally as an early and important practitioner of conceptual art. He is a professor emeritus at the School of Visual Arts at the University of Windsor, a, re a recipient of a Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Arts, an officer of the Order of Canada, and a member of the Order of British Columbia. Using everyday objects and processes, Baxter and creates works that engage audiences in contemporary social, political, and environmental issues. So 
Um, thank you, Ian. Hopefully you'll be here soon. And I'll also introduce Susan Gold, who is a visual artist working out of 110 Park, a working studio, a working space in Windsor, experimenting with community engagement, plexus activity, and street level window installations. She was born in Detroit, Michigan, and became a Canadian citizen in 1986 and is a professor emerita having taught visual arts from 1977 to 2012 at the University of Windsor. Susan Gold is interested in how nature is understood and drawn into our lives. She works through images collected in museums, laboratories, and for the last year in her own neighborhood, examining the ways urbanized people contend with their loss and separation from nature. So with that said, I'll pass it over to Ian, and, or to Spencer rather, Spencer and Susan, and I'll see if I can get Ian on, um, on the call as well. So Spencer and Susan, over to you. Thanks, Sophie, and thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, I just want to say really quick, it's, a, it's really interesting for me here to do this with Susan. Um, because Susan was one of the people who suggested conservation to me back in the day when I was in art school. I don't know if you remember it, but it was really, really quick. It was just something because a lot of my art was very science based. And she said, you should just look into conservation. And that kind of set me on the path to where I am today. So thank you, Susan, for that. Um, so if you look at on the on the slides are the two works that we're kind of showcasing today. and we have Ian Baxter and Animal Preserve number four and Susan Gold's The Specimens. So I think it's really interesting because they kind of have these, these parallels and like that they're all like uh, an assemblage of little objects. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. And we're gonna talk about how they were created and, and more through like a conservation lens because that's kind of what the exhibition Restored Treasures is all about. Um, really quick, I wanted to do a quick, I guess, disclaimer. Um, part of a conservator's role in restoration of contemporary art is to try and get as much information as possible. So that involves artist interviews and talking with artists. So something like that we're doing right now. Uh, but an unfortunate consequence of that is that we kind of put our own ideas into the into the artist's minds and whether that be real or perceived it, 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 that bias is is you can't take that bias out so i just want to say right off the bat uh to both susan and if and if ian gets in here that uh uh there's no uh judgment there's no wrong answers you know what i mean like it, it's all just for the interest of the art. So I guess my first question then for Susan is, can you tell us a bit about your art practice? Or like what, what, what's driving it today? And like, what, what kind of things uh, um, are you working on like right now? Um, well, when I thought about that, cause you gave me the questions in advance, thank you. <laughs> I thought I'm very similar uh, interests in my work, but it might not seem so. Uh, my work's gone through a lot of changes and, um, but it, it's very satisfying. It's kind of lovely when you, you're working along, uh, following your nose basically and what you're interested in now and, um, and something comes back to something that you worked on in the past. It seems to validate uh your journey and you know and um it, it's very nice that it happens uh this work that you're showing on the screen uh, it, that work around that time represented a break in my in my practice and uh um we we're working at the time since the 60s with uh, a push against the art art being an object that can be bought and sold and then asking a question, um, if there's no art market and, and you're making art, uh, what is, what's art 
what is art and what is it good for and what is it made for and what are you doing basically so um that exploration i'm still working on now and uh you know, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. Right now, I, I'm working with, in a pandemic space, basically, for the last couple of years. And I'm really self-reflexive and noticing the changes in my work and the, because there's changes in my space, there's changes with what excites me. Um, a, a lot of my art was driven by two, two things. One was uh, the mail art that comes in and uh, comes in on the computer and comes in all the time. And, and like you said, that can't help but influence you. So you apply what you're thinking to the particular question or project or direction that the people send to you. And that's been really helpful. The mail art community has continued in a significant way through, these, through this pandemic and uh, helped me to continue in my work. Um, the other thing is I was, before it started, I was working on a project called Urban Gardening uh, with a couple of colleagues and studio mates. And uh, so we continued on that project through the pandemic and, and we're still working on it. <laughs> well, that's really interesting. I, during the pandemic, gardening has obviously something that I've been doing too. Sorry, the dog is barking. <laughs> I have a dog too. <laughs> um, and I also thought that like ex exploring kind of uh, thing that you were talking about is really interesting because in, in your work, it uh, I'm going to see if I can change the slide. I can. There's an installation shot. Um, and here's like a close up. And in, in this work specifically, each little bottle has like kind of something different in it so it, it gives that real feel of like exploration as you're as you're going through like these different little um I, I don't know what to call them I guess different little um images that are 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 on this little acetate that's in the bottle um can you speak to um how this work specifically came to like fruition, I guess? Um, it actually started with the mail art project and this, uh, an archivist from Belgium was asking for archival objects. And, um, and I collected stuff on my desk, various on my desk, and I put it in a, a jar of a medicine uh, bottle like that and mailed it away. And that started me on actually having just continuing to do it, having to gone to the having going to having gone to the pharmacy and asked for uh, a big bag of uh, of those kind of bottles. Um, and then uh, I'm always interested in transparency and and time related and science related things. So a lot of uh, those images were captured and then uh, photocopied on transparency. So you see through them, there's a lot, there's, sometimes there's two or three images in the same bottle. But it's interesting because I went to the show to see yesterday, to see the show before I was gonna talk about it. And um, I had an amazing, the show's wonderful, it's excellent. And I was so pleased to be in a room with uh, uh, revered colleagues, Ian, that I see now, <laughs> and um, I forgot. Anyway, um, the the boxer, the name of the artist. Do you? Oh, Greg Colonel. Yeah, Greg Colonel. He was one of my heroes. So, anyway, I was really uh, proud to be in their room with 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 those artists, and um, when I looked at the work. Um, it, all it brought back to me was waves of memory. And of course of that, so it's how the work has changed for me in the last decades is, was quite moving. And of course I looked at the little bottles and each, each bottle reminded me of a story or a place or a book or some experience. And um, 
but the whole thing just was waves of memory uh, went over me. And that certainly showed me the difference between an artist seeing their work at different in different periods of time. It's it's not the same. It changes. I, I think that's really interesting too, because in the documentation way back in like the files of the AGW, there's lots of files. But what I found with this work was there's a list and it's almost like a list of inspirations um, that you had provided the art gallery. And it, and it describes not specifically each little bottle, but like different inspirations that these images may have came from. So I, I wonder if, if even that, that list or that archive would be part of the work at part of like the visual work. I think that would be a great that would be a great idea, and it would um, bring me back to revisit each bottle. I'd love to do that. I was I was loving looking at it, and um, yeah. So I think that definitely uh, you say it's already archived. So or it's not. It's it seems like, and I'm I'm sorry I didn't bring a a scan of it with us today, but um, it seems like. Not uh, not a complete list, but it's it's like all where the information or where like your imagery was sourced. So it's like it, it's almost like a bibliography of the visual material. It's really interesting. Right. Somehow that was very important to me. It could be a rabbit hole like you'd go down. Yeah, <laughs> too much. But um, I'd like to try. I'd like to see that list anyway and and see my former self and what I put in. Well, for sure, I'll get that to you. And we have Ian here. Or well, sorry, thanks, Susan, for sharing. That was that was great. If you don't mind, I'm gonna go back to the other slides, and I'll ask Ian some of the same questions. So, can you hear me through the way it is now, or do I have to have my phone? No, I can hear you fine. How well, are you, Ian? Thanks for joining good. us. Sorry for the confusion. Yeah, I have a a new laptop, but apparently. It doesn't have the Zoom thing in it, but I was able to use Louisa's, so it, it seems to work. No worries, we're happy you're here. I, so, so I was, we were just talking with Susan, and Susan was, we asked about her art practice in general. Do you, do you uh, have like, can you speak to what your art practice is now and like what inspires you? Well, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, I can. It's a bit a bit about everything, and uh, one of the main factors is the idea of information. That's been a driving force for me all these years, and McLuhan, and like all that. And, and as I've often said, I, I was kind of fortunate in a way to not go to art school because I kind of came in through the back door, and uh, so that that just was left me quite wide open to what was possible. And I think some of you know my background was a degree in kind of zoology. And, uh, and it, that got me to think about environmental stuff and all of that. And, and then happen, happening to go to UBC in 64 was really fortunate. I, I, I didn't realize till I got there. I mean, a pretty really funny side story. My, when you go as a new prof to UBC, they have a set of houses that you can that they let you live until you get accommodated in the city. And my neighbor was David Suzuki, which is so strange. <laughs> and so we, I got to know him a little bit then and stuff like that. But anyways, uh, and the other thing about UBC was they were featuring McLuhan and they were using McLuhan as, as this kind of Canadian icon, having talks about him and all this different stuff. So I, I was really lucky to just fall into all that stuff. So that was, so then uh, out of it all grew all these different ways of looking at what art could be. And, uh, and that's, and so this is what's happened all these years. And, and then the other fortunate thing was ending up in Windsor at the end of my teaching career, meeting Susan and all the other great faculty that we had. And so uh, yeah, it's been a great trip. So. Awesome. I don't know if that gives you some idea, but. Uh, it's nice to see these two pieces here with little bottles. I, I think maybe some of you know, I did a piece with 600 bottles. That's at the National Gallery. 
and uh, it's on a big long 20 something foot shelf, but it's very similar to these little guys like this. And it's all about e ecological sustainability and about saving the species. And I just wanted a way to have people think about it. If we're not careful, this is maybe how we're gonna look at all of our animals in the future. And we may even be there ourselves if we're not lucky. Especially what's going on in the world right now, which is stupid. Well, I think it's really interesting that you have a zoology background and this kind of has that those themes of 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 uh, like little samples of something that would be in a lab. Yeah, well, it's, you know, because you spend time when I did all those early classes, you're, you're in with all these specimens. And, and I also got to do a book on the wildlife of the northern Rocky Mountains and I illustrated all the little birds. And so I'm always we we're always looking at specimens. So in a way, all the stuffed animals are, are kind of like the specimens of the animals that we all fun and have fun on and have them on our beds and in our houses and whatever, right? And uh, no, and then the other really important thing, and I, as I go back to look at my career, taking the, going and doing classes in ecology was, was also the other really important thing because eco thinking is all about everything that's connected. And I, I guess that's what I've been about and I keep trying to do that. And so I, I just, um, such a, I, one of the driving words in my life is the word wonder. I mean, you just wonder what's gonna happen and what's, and so I'm always scanning and looking at lots of dispar disparate information to see the connections. So hey. anyways, nice to see you, Susan. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Okay, so I, and plus, I and by the way, your your this show you've done is in my books is one of the most amazing shows. No one's hardly ever done it. And it should be really lauded for what you've done. Well, thank you. It's very kind of you to say. I must admit, it's a it was a collaborative effort between everybody at the art gallery. So no, it's so great to come up with that idea. Yeah. And it's been needed. And none of us hardly know what goes on behind the scenes. Although I know you did work at the National Gallery or you went there and apprenticed or something, right? Yeah, I was there for a bit, yeah. And I, I actually had, I met Russell, Russell Harper was his name way back in the 60s. I think it was 63 or something. And he invited me to come there and be a, a student worker one summer. So I got to work in the whole National Gallery. I helped him on a catalog on uh, Winslow Homer. And so it was really a great, it was a little bit like the experience you had. Yeah, definitely gets you some good footing. Well, you go all the way through the, 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 the rooms in the basement to the, everything else. In the place. Yeah. So it's great. So I, I've been fortunate enough to be involved with a lot of both of your works, really. And, mm -hmm. and it's, I find it very interesting. Uh, so both you and Susan, both Ian and Susan uh, use um very co conventional materials so like I, I i'll see like paintings or photographs but at the same time you you both really dabble into like a new realm of art using using found materials or creating art out of things that people wouldn't necessarily think art would be made of um and i'm wondering if uh you can speak to like the material choices of some of your unconventional materials like why why these materials have value to you or or why you chose them oops sorry i went too far i'll go back to a slide where where both of your oh, that one. yeah i, I don't Do know it's because, of the, because of the way i scan all the time i'm all and then you know some idea will get fermented a bit and then i might see some material that could uh, could help give that more strength or something so, I mean, I, I love going, I guess it's uh, reconnaissance shopping, you could say. Like, you know, when Louise and I go out shopping, I'm always looking for things that I might be able to use as art. And it could be in Winners or Home Depot or a food store. I'm always just open for that possibility. And, it, and it's kind of worked all these years. So I, I'm not absolutely sure what, what, I, what I might come up with, right? Um, 
I've been, I'll show you a little later a work I've been working on using cell phones. Oh, interesting. Because, yeah, because it's something that we're, uh, God, we're, I mean, we're so, it, but I mean, I think Susan might be in the same generation as us. But we never grew up with cell phones. So I'm always wondering where it is. Like I don't, it's sometimes it's just in my pocket and I don't know where I forget it. I leave it in the car. And I mean, but I know kids that never leave their hand. Mm -hmm. And they walk on the streets now. It's kind of sad in a way. They just look look in the cell phone while they're walking. But it's bizarre. But so I'm trying to make a. That, that's one of the new works I'm working on. Awesome, <laughs> Susan. What are what are your thoughts about your material choices, especially the ones that are unconventional? Well, it's a kind of a found thing, but I don't do it as much uh, in the stores and stuff as Ian does. But um, what I come across and what's on my desk and uh, and um, I, it's it, you're very open when you're when you're looking to um, to to understand what is art and you're making stuff. Um, you end up uh, your process, you end up pulling a lot of things in if you're not thinking about the art market. You pull a lot of things in to make make things with, and um, and then the uh, it's very nice. The museums and and the, and the galleries kind of step up to the plate to try to uh, actually turn these things into something they can show and restore and and sell. But the artist is is just out there um, being inspired and and pulling things into their studio. And I think Susan would agree with me, like one of the lucky things are that we were able to be teachers and I really got a lot out of that experience. And it also meant that I, I didn't have to worry about selling work because mm -hmm. it's, it's a whole other, it can take you down a whole other avenue. Mm -hmm. and it's, so teaching is, is really, was really rewarding for me and I'm sure for mm -hmm. me. Yeah. And, and it also keeps you motivated and thinking mm. very interesting maybe i'll become a teacher one day <laughs> yeah no well and i that's why i love to just go back and hang out at the at the, so uh what's it called soca is that right yeah that's what we because you, you meet all like kids there and it's fun to just kind of ask them and challenge them a little bit hear what they're doing uh, it, it, you, it's, you can't stop it's just one of those things I think artists are free now, really, uh, for decades to use alternative materials and yeah. um, not think about tradition and, and preservation and all that. Leave that work to you guys. And um, if, it, if it appears on your desk and you make something with it, then, then uh, unless you leave it there, uh, you have to present it in some way. So then the presentation becomes another uh, way and so the uh, the presentations in these cases are alternative also, and um, they have certain references to what you are, you know, what you're thinking and doing and how you want to present it. So that uh, that becomes an additional challenge. Yeah. And, and part of my the thing that Susan just mentioned that for you people as conservation people, I've sometimes in a kind of just fun way, I like the idea that what we do could be a big challenge for you guys because it gives you the excitement of how do we restore this or change it or can we add on to it or what like and so that's a whole big area that's opening up for young guys like you yeah well like what do you do with these bottles and this and that well i think it shows like it shows that the work is a process it isn't an object mm -hmm. It's a process, like Ian says, that you can add on to it or change it and do it, you know, work in different ways with it. Um, so it, it really makes it like the, my experience of going to the work and seeing it after many decades and, and having different experiences it's, it's a living, it's a living thing. It, it completely changes. Yeah, and it's just like all of us, like living and going, changing through all these decades. And so it's exciting for the whole area of, conservation it's it's i'm sure in your case now you've you're pretty excited about that field 
Oh, I'm very excited. Actually, I'm, I'm curious to know more about that. Like it's, it's a, if it's like this living object or, and, and with presentation in mind, because yeah, like a traditional painting, you would just hang on the wall, right? Like the presentation is very, very, um, I don't know, I guess dictated throughout time, but. Actually, actually not really because the context is becomes the important thing. And of course the framing is part of like, to use the word, not as a physical sense, but the framing or presentation of the work and what it's next to. Um, uh, that could cause a lot of controversy. What painting you put next to what object or what other painting uh, has a lot to do with the meaning. And um, so. And I also know like when I got early on into plastic, I mean, none of us realized what plastic was all about. And now it's coming, we're all analyzing, coming back to, but I, I don't mind. I, I like that because it, it shows kind of the history of, of plastic and now, chemists and people are trying to, if we want to keep using that, that material, are we finding a way for it to biodegrade or whatever? And mm -hmm. uh, so uh, my works, I just feel were part of that, that history and knowledge base that goes on. And, uh, but it's, I mean, you, I'm sure you know more about it than Susan and I, but like people like Jackson Pollock and those artists, I, I mean, I'm sure their paintings, they're having to look at them or do something, right? Because they just use house paint and whatever. And uh, I mean, and there's so much amazing ways that artists are using materials today. I mean, it's just, there's unlimited amount of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you mentioned plastic because the the bottles in the specimens by you, Susan, is they're, they're little plastic bottles. And yeah. plastic has become almost a nightmare for conservators because while it does last forever right it doesn't biodegrade the way we would hope it would um the qualities that artists might find um useful about the material so say like the clarity of the plastic or the 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 strength that tends to degrade over time so it's just it's an interesting kind of challenge Especially with my own paintings like i, I don't know how they're discoloring or changing and but in a, some way that's just part of its life history too so uh, there was a big show at maybe you know the one in Toronto that just happened about there's a plastic group of artists or something do you know about that show it no, just happened at the University of Toronto Art Gallery and it's now going over to France and they kind of looking at the pluses and minuses of plastic it's, it's a group of five or six artists that have focused on that. I'll, I'll give you that data pretty soon. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw up a slide if I can get it. I think I can do it. Oh, there we go. Hmm. No. Maybe I pressed the button too many times. <laughs> well. This is one of my first Zoom meetings. There we go. Can you, can you both see there's like two rocks almost? Right. Yeah. So so something, um, so a little, an, an unknown aspect of conservation for most people anyways, mm -hmm. is uh, dissociation. So the Canadian Conservation Institute defines uh, 10 agents of deterioration that all like artworks or cultural heritage goes through. And the last and final one is dissociation. And that is basically the loss of information or the loss of the information that connects to the object. So I think that it's really interesting thinking about both of your works and looking at this image, they have uh, two accession numbers put on this rock, right? However, it's obviously the same image. And one's just flipped under. One just like flipped. so depending on how you look at this object, the accession number and the and all the information that has been associated with it could be completely different. It's so, like some magic trick, right? Almost, right? Like it, uh, America's Got Talent or something. <laughs> So well, I think it's really interesting because it was a challenge and both, and I'd like to thank both of you because you were both very open to my questions upon uh, wanting to install your works in this um, exhibition uh, because we had like, and I'll, I'll show you some other images. 
this was Ian's. So this was, Ian, this was on the left, we have right before we put all the, uh, the jars on the shelves. Actually, you can kind of see the jars and the reflection in the mirror. Oh, yeah. But we were unsure of how, like which jar went where. We knew from this, archi like, this archival document that I believe you provided back oh, in the day. Oh, right. yeah, it's a little bit like Susan's stuff there. Yeah, what I, I remember like two bigger ones on the bottom, I guess. Yeah. What, you know. But I actually don't mind if, if curators in the future want to play around with it, like put one big one on top and one on the bottom. Or I'm, I'm, it doesn't bother me. Yeah, because you were both speaking to how these objects or these pieces kind of become living and they, they change over time. So I, I think that's very interesting. So this cabinet, I, you know that store, I never know how to say it. That's for J.S. Gisk or what? That's what well, I always go walking through there. If I see something, I mean, I don't want to build that. It's already there. <laughs> so, and it's perfect for what I want to do, right? Yeah. And so I, I think I bought I bought five of those. I've still got them. I'm gonna do them in different. Like maybe they're different, like birds and alleg and um, reptiles and mammals. So it, it's just the way it goes. But well, and and to the point of you saying that like you wouldn't mind if a curator moved like a larger bottle to the shelf. Like that's very valuable information for for me as a curator uh, because now that we know that you're okay with that, we can kind of do that. Because otherwise we're kind of in a lurch, right? Not really sure of the, the it's like the, the right way to display. Because it. I think the statement is strong enough that it still holds together whatever way you, that it's fun for the curator to, to maybe add their own little dimension to it. Yeah. And, and with Susan's, like this is how Susan's was stored in the art gallery. So this is on the left, you have, um, well, one, right off the bat, it was, it was stored as two pieces and it's acquired as two pieces. Mm -hmm. And I, I had asked Susan, and Susan, maybe you can uh, reiterate, like, is this work two pieces or, or one? Uh, no, it was one piece. And uh, it was a question of, of, uh, niggling over the price of it when the art gallery bought it right and um so we uh we got down to uh why don't they just buy four of the shelves and then i'll donate four of the shelves so mm -hmm. that's how we we managed that and it, that was a good way to manage it but when i went there and i saw the eight shelves and how high i couldn't even see mm -hmm. uh what was in the jars on the top I thought, you know what? Maybe in that show they were put side by side. <laughs> Do you have? Right. And uh, you know, and then I thought, well, it wouldn't matter. I can see why somebody would put it that high up, like start that high up, because of kids, you know, handling it, and it would be more vulnerable closer down. But and you could see more of the if it was side by side. But I, I actually like made the work to be eight shelves and, and create that kind of uh, silhouette rectangle. So I was glad to see the way you did it, but um, I wouldn't be, you know, uh, put out if it was put side by side or only four shelves were hung or something like that. Yeah. So Susan, did you buy all those or did you get those through the university from the science department? Um, no, actually those came from a pharmacy. I walked into a pharmacy and I asked, if I could get some more jars like they gave for Phil's. And he ordered me a big plastic bag full. There was a big bag full of them. Um, I don't think you could get them again. You know, they change everything uh, so often. So um, let's see, Susan and I, as artists, like I, I once needed some glass eyes. So what do you do? Well, I went to an optometrist on Olette Street. I just knocked on the door. So do you have any like default glass eyes? And the guy, like no one's ever asked him that, right? So he comes out with a little bag. And I said, how much do you want? He says, oh, give me 50 bucks. So I said, okay. And so that way I was able to embed them in this painting I did, right? But you, you just well, gotta you really go. drive people crazy. <laughs> yeah, you gotta go where you gotta go when you want something. Uh, it's really but you have to get them on, you have to get them because they all have like references or 
just kind of information coming from the actual form. So once at the university, I thought um, I'll have, they had a glass blower that made all these test tubes and, and bottles. Um, and he, you know, I asked him to make a bottle for me, like a scientific bottle. And it came out looking like a perfume bottle because he thought it was for art. Yeah. And so, you know, it, and the bottles that I just happened across or found worked a lot better than the one that was made for me because um, he put too much incorrect information into the making. Well, these are really for specimens, which is what you were wanting to do. Yeah. Well, these are actually pharmacy. They're like, they're for pills. Yeah. And when I had the show, um, uh, uh, I think it was three shelves in a certain configuration in Toronto. It was right in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. one person approached me and, and said that was the feeling he got from it, that clinical um, mm -hmm. AIDS and pills and, and that kind of pharmaceutical. And I can understand that, you know. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now the each into the way that this work was installed this time, uh, the bottles were arranged in the exact way that they were from a previous documentation photo. Now, are you is it like do you prefer that particular arrangement or or is it more of like a living object like we were speaking about before? Well, if I were putting it up, I'd I'd put it up in a certain way that would you know, include my memories and, and, but what I, uh, what I suggested to you was um, just wait it visually. Yeah. And uh, so it, it really doesn't matter. I have favorites that you'd put at eye level and different. So um, you did a very good job. <laughs> well, thanks to the AGW prep team, because I don't think, I don't think I was even there when it when it <laughs> Okay. Thanks to that. <laughs> And, so it's great. So you came back to Windsor, right? Me? I've been back in Windsor for uh, almost four years now. Time oh, really? oh, okay. COVID, right? Because you're yeah. Yeah, where the last two years gone, right? Yeah, it's like a lost period all over in our heads. It's strange. Yeah. Okay, I guess my last question before um, we open it up to people who are here to ask questions too is. And you both kind of commented this on this already, but I guess in in the understanding of your work and in the 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 preservation or the restoration or uh, and all these decisions that art galleries make or that curators make or that conservators make, do you think that artists have a responsibility to provide that information, or should it be like the responsibility of the institution to kind of like, you know what I mean? Like, just kind of like, I, as artists, I want to know what, what your thoughts on that kind of subject are. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Susan, you go. Okay. It's a loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> um, I think the artist has their responsibility in making the work. And, uh, and then once the work is, uh, you know, you might have a personal desire to give up a template or something like that, but I I think it's free in the world. Once you and and it's free for everyone to put their own memories and thoughts in, and and you just have to hope that um, that you made it strong enough so that the main idea comes across and it'll hold up. But I think. I don't think I can have any responsibility for the museum or or, um, or the curator. I, I, I don't mind like the young guys like you, maybe this will be the new way. Like it's okay for you to call us and talk to us. And I, I think that's a, a healthy uh, dimension coming. Cause I, I'm, it's a bit like, Susan, like we make these pieces and, and, uh, and then, it comes into the museum and but if you ever want to call us like you're doing now that's okay mm -hmm. so we can all learn about, about yeah i just i i think my motivation because i think very long term like i'm talking when i won't even be here <laughs> right. so, so 
By well, you can do your your you have your own responsibility as a curator. Those are yours, and I think they're separate from the artist. Right. And you can do your research, and and to me, it's like a translator. What you know, I mean, a translator has a huge responsibility to the to what they're translating. But how can the author have any control over that? Mm -hmm. So you're both uh, you're wanting to be a curator, or you are now, or, or, or the two. Are you asking me? I am. Yeah. I am a. I'm a art conservator at heart. So people always ask me if I'm an artist, and I say no because my art's not particularly good. Um, but I. I am an art conservator, and I'm. Cur I curated this this exhibition, but it's through that lens of conservation, right? So that's where my expertise lies. But as you, if curating becomes like a whole other little dimension for you that will be exciting that you have this background that a lot of curators don't have mm -hmm. and, and it might open up and you are good at it well, and you'll know. have new ways for exhibitions that will just like you're doing now and that and that is really interesting so we would say carry on <laughs> well thank you yeah you're both too kind um, <laughs> Shall we open the floor for to take questions from our attendees? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, now, Sophie has said to drop your questions in the Q and A box, but Sophie, I can't see a Q and A box, so I don't know if <laughs> if maybe you want to read them out. Absolutely, I think you should be able to hear my voice kind of in the background. But there is a question in the chat box. Um, from Nora, specifically for Susan. Um, and Nora asks, Susan, could you please tell us about some of the image in the images in the bottles? Um, share a little bit more about those. Okay, you could put that slide back. Maybe I'll pick one that, because I could go on, how many are there? <laughs> 165 or something. That one. There, so right in the middle of the screen, and it was right in the middle of the piece at my eye level was uh, this fish image. And it was uh, the, um, the Galamanca fish uh, from Siberia. And um, actually, I'll pick that one because it tells about a lot of the piece. Um, when, I was in, when I was at Lake Baikal in the museum, they have a little museum there that explains the the lake, it explains everything about the lake it's scientifically and historically. It's the deepest lake of French water, of fresh water in the world. And there's these fish that swim blind at the bottom and they're totally transparent. It's this magical fish called the Galamanca. And, um, and anyway, then uh, in the, the right above it, there's a bottle with a, um, it looks like a little black, rock or blob in it. I don't know if you can see this. I can't point and it doesn't make any sense when I point. You see anyway, you see the fish yeah. is right in the middle. And and then there's the one, that's Lake Baikal. Um, there's a rock in Lake Baikal. So when we were on Lake Baikal, people were telling me the story of Lake Baikal and it contained all this mythology about the lake. So they were explaining the lake in several different ways. There was a scientific explanation, there was a mythological, there was our experience now. And so um, this fits into, it, it's like ways of knowing something. And, and those ways of knowing are transparent and other ideas can come in. So uh, basically um, that's like, so what was I saying? Anyway, that explains two of the jars and how how they fit in with uh, ways of knowing something. And uh, so there's scientific ways of knowing, there's personal handwriting, there's some drawings, um, uh, there's little scientific objects as they would appear in an archive or, or in a science textbook. And then there's actual how they would appear in nature. So it's different ways of seeing things and ways of knowing. And so that's what's in the separate jars. 
Awesome. And Nora in the chat says, how wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you for sharing. Um, we also have a question from Linda in the Q&A box who says, a quote from Joseph Albers, thus art is not an object, it is an experience. And to you both, your artistic endeavors definitely support his words. Um, so that was lovely, Linda. I don't know if um, you both have thoughts on that quote because it, I think what Spencer has created at the Art Gallery of Windsor with his exhibition and the works that he's chosen to present is definitely an experience. As you walk through the gallery, gallery, that curtain is lifted and you get to see behind the scenes. So it is definitely an experience. It's true. Yeah, and I think Albers was part of that revolution of pushing against the idea of art as an object. So that's really appropriate yeah. that he's fitting that he said that he was one of the first ones. Yeah. That's true. So um, there is also, oh, go ahead, Ian, sorry. No, go ahead, uh, it's okay. Um, there is also another question in uh, the Q&A from the familiar name, Elaine Carr. Um, asked, I noticed that you both refer to your process as being a value in your work. I wondered if you could include your thoughts and diagrams in the exhibitions. And hi to you both from Elaine. <laughs> I don't know who wants to jump in first. Yeah, um, yeah I'm not, um, I'm, I'm wondering, I don't get the total picture of that question. Um, so I think what Elaine is asking is you both have diagrams and thoughts and kind of sketches and a mm -hmm. lot of background information on the works. Do you think in the future that you could include those in an exhibition or into the work itself? Yeah, I, yeah those are things like for new work for curators like Spencer and people, if they wish to do that, it might be interesting to have those notes and things. Because as artists, we always kind of, sketching inside of on um, backs and in in some I just do stuff inside of books if I don't have any paper and it's kind of crazy all over the place but yeah to have to have shows that show some of that would be would be interesting and it's not often done exactly. I think that, yeah that would I probably that was a decision that uh, that um, Spencer made whether to include those yeah in this show or not. Yeah, um, he certainly nice. included I, I a lot of other information. So that could have been on a regular that, show, it might be distracting. Yeah. But um, that archive that Spencer uh, described could certainly become part of the piece. And mm -hmm. then you'd expect that it would be hung in it. I think it would make it, uh, it would make a big difference. It wouldn't show the process more. Yeah, I and it would that. bring people in to the, the bring people into the work and looking at the jars, it would, it would be a way in for people. Yeah, I, I agree. That would be neat. Um, yeah. So you Sorry, mentioned, don't... You mentioned oh, earlier, you wanted, somebody said you want to know some of the works that we were doing now, like some of the new stuff that we're working on. So I did bring this, uh, this piece, I had this piece here that I'm working on. And what it is, is, uh, like I told you with cell phones, I've been analyzing, watching the younger generation and, and trying to wonder what they're gonna do or will they ever, yeah, I know, will they ever release it a bit or go out and, and really uh, look at birds and animals and all these things. So what I've done is I have gone and bought a, a soother. And so I, I, I feel that the cell phone is a soother. And we, uh, so I, I'm working on some videos where I go places and do this because I want people to see this. I mean, it's really great to have a soother, but it can also wreck your mouth and your teeth if you do it forever, right? As a baby. And so what we've got to do is learn when to take it out and, and let it just hang somewhere, right? And then put your cell phone down and go see the other realities. So that's one of the works that I'm working on. And so it's been fun to go in baby stores and look for soothers. Awesome, thank you so much for, for sharing, Ian. I was wondering, Susan, is there anything that you're working on that 
um, that you'd like to share maybe a behind the scenes into your your current oh, practice i don't have anything right prepared <laughs> that was Susan's great always, Susan's <laughs> in, she's always well you're you're always uh with what's an arts day and all you're you're very much into yeah. those those things and you help gently energize yeah. those so uh, yeah, i got great. a mail art booklet from germany today that yeah. made my heart sing <laughs> and uh but i took it upstairs so i'm not going to run upstairs and get it but uh the mailbox things come every day and they uh they can't mm -hmm. help but um influence you and start you moving in the studio well, I think susan and i you could say one of the aspects of being an artist is it's really kind of a fun way to live your life and, uh, and it's it's very rewarding and uh, yeah, I, I've, it's been such a great experience. Absolutely. So we're just coming up on seven o'clock. Um, and I think I'll pass it back over to Spencer. Maybe if you'd like to share a little bit more about the programming that you're hosting on Saturdays, um, how people can get involved and come see you and meet you at the gallery and um, learn a little bit more about the, the process of uh, preserving and conserving art. Sure, thanks, Sophie. Um, within uh, the space, there's a, a, a pop-up conservation lab, I like to call it. And on select Saturdays, I'm doing conservation work on select pieces. So both Ian's and Susan's pieces will get highlighted at one point. Um, but the, the schedule and the works that I'll be working on are on the AGW's website. So I encourage you to visit, check out the time that I'll be there and the date and what I'm doing. And you can come in, ask questions, engage with me and see the process firsthand. Um, but I guess I just want to really thank Ian and Susan. So open and helpful with everything. And I love, I love, love, love both of your works there. It was just a pleasure to get the chance to include them and see them. Well, in this modern day, I've been talking to you on the phone, but now I get to this next image of seeing you here. So we'll get together in the near future. Very good. And Susan, great to see you. We haven't seen each other. We've been all locked down, right? Yeah, nice but, to see uh, you. Yeah, but we'll we'll all get out and get together in the future. And, and I guess also a special thanks to Sophie and the Art Gallery Windsor for making this happen because what an experience. It was it was great. Okay. So we Absolutely. all just carry, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> the good effort Absolutely. and trust. And yeah. trust. Yeah. Thanks again. Yeah. Yeah, and there's so many messages of, of thanks in the chat as well for, for both you, Ian, and, and Susan and Spencer as well. If you haven't been to the Art Gallery of Windsor yet, we are open so you can come and visit us in person and walk through the new exhibitions and you'll get to experience Restored Treasures Part 1 um, yeah. because there will be a Part 2, which is I very exciting. exciting. And how long is this, what, this one on for? Till when? Uh, early May. Oh, good, good. Okay. Yeah. 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 So there's definitely time to come in and visit us and meet Spencer, who will be in the, in the space uh, working on some <laughs> works of art um, on select Saturdays. But let's keep this conversation going. You can always find us online as well at agw.ca. And you can follow us on social media at agw401. We have tons of resources and videos and podcasts and kind of behind the scenes content too that is being released um, for Restored Treasures. So you get to see even more behind the scenes. Um, so do follow us online as well. I but you, I, I wanna- ex Oh, sorry. I think you said you're gonna keep this as a document or something. Yes, so this event is being recorded this evening and we're also streaming on Facebook Live. So we'll be able to go back and, and listen to uh, the, the recording. It's going to be posted on our YouTube channel as well. Um, but I wanna extend my thanks to Spencer and to Susan and to Ian for being here this evening. Thank you to everyone who's watching at home 
and we hope to see you all very soon at the Art Gallery of Windsor. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can all see each other here <laughs> um, and I can see all of your faces and wish you all a great rest of your evening and uh, we hope to see you all very soon in person when we get to celebrate in the gallery. Thanks, Hopefully that'll thanks be soon. everybody that that came out. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Have a great night. <laughs> Bye.